Okay, welcome everybody. Good afternoon to those of you in New York and in Argentina and perhaps in other places of the world. Uh, my name is Dr. Julio Paza and I am the director of the Department of Cardiology at Westchester Medical Center. And I'm proud and honored to moderate this first webinar between the two chapters of the American College of Cardiology, the one from New York State and the one from Argentina. This fulfills one of the two goals that we set several years ago related to the twinning project of the Central American College of Cardiology that was to pair a domestic chapter, in this case, New York, and an international chapter, in this case, Argentina. We're not the only pair, but we certainly have been very active in the last several years. The other goal, which uh, we will hear about uh, later on, it's about the facilitation of rotations from uh, trainees from Argentina in New York State hospitals, something that we started back in 2019 and had to put in a parenthesis during the pandemic, but we have now restarted. And as I said before, we will talk about it uh, more in, in a few minutes. I'm going to try not to advance to the next slide. That basically is the summary of what we're going to hear today in what we now have called a tale of two chapters. And I am accompanied now by a very uh, prominent faculty, uh, Dr. Dimitri Feldman, who is a professor of medicine at Royal Cornell Medical College. He's an interventional cardiologist and the director of endovascular services at New York Presbyterian Hospital. And very importantly, he is the incoming governor of the New York State ACC chapter. Dr. Hima Vidula, who is an associate professor of medicine and medical director of mechanical circulatory support now at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, she is the immediate past governor of the New York chapter and now a chair elect of the board of governors of the ACC and also a trustee of the American College of Cardiology. And Dr. Shuhari Naidu, who is a professor of medicine at New York Medical College. He's the director of the cath lab and of the HCM program here at Westchester Medical Center. And he is the current governor of the ACC um, New York chapter. On the Argentina side, I'm accompanied by Dr. Jose Luis Navarro Estrada, who is a past president of the Argentine Society of Cardiology and the current governor of the Argentina chapter of the American College of Cardiology. Dr. Eduardo Perna, who is a past president of the Argentina Federation of Cardiology, and he is a vice governor of the Argentina chapter of the ACC. Dr. Juan Muntaner, who is the chair of the Ischemic Heart Disease Committee of the Argentine Federation of Cardiology. He is the director of the CCU at the Model Heart Institute in Tucumán, Argentina. And finally, Dr. Stutzbach, who is uh, the president-elect of the Argentine Society of Cardiology. Uh, this webinar will be based on two case presentations. Um, and the idea is to exchange ideas between the two chapters. And it will have the format of a case presentation, the first one by one of our uh, fellows in training from New York that will be uh, discussed or commented on by faculty from Argentina. Then we will have uh, about 10 minutes or so to hear about the experiences of some of the trainees who have rotated in New York hospitals. And then we'll go back to do a presentation of the case from Argentina that will be commented on by the New York faculty. We have a very tight agenda. So my only role would be to police the time and make sure that we adhere to the tight agenda that we have so that we finish um, on time. So without further ado, I want to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Afsana Rahman, who is a, an advanced heart failure transplant cardiology fellow at the Columbia University Irving Medical Center. Importantly, uh, for the purpose of this uh, webinar, she is an advocacy fellow in training representative for the New York chapter of the American College of Cardiology. Asana, thank you very much for all the effort that you have put in putting this case together and um, take it away from here 
uh, until we get to a point that you will present uh, a question uh, about what to do with your patient that the Argentina faculty will comment on. Thank you so much, Dr. Panza. Um, I'm greatly appreciative of the opportunity of getting to present a case here. Um, I'll do my best. So um, here we have a 29-year-old woman, blood type O. She has a history of non-ischemic cardio uh, my cardiomyopathy, initially diagnosed uh, 2018. The presentation's uh, this year, 2023. EF was 15 to 20%. She was relatively dilated with an LVDD of 6.3. Uh, class three symptoms and ha also has an ICD, um, had moderate to severe AR. Uh, she presented to initially an outside hospital with symptoms of shortness of breath, was found to have um, decompensated heart failure uh, as well as a pneumonia. Um, she eventually was classified as sky C shock with evidence of hypoperfusion and a shock liver. Uh, she was started on an inotrope with millinone, um 0.25 initially and then transferred to uh, a tertiary care hospital at to Columbia University for further care and consideration for advanced therapies. A uh, little bit of information about her past medical history. Um, in addition to the non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, she had uh, atrial fibrillation, initially medically managed, now well-controlled, had episodes of VT with shock earlier this year, uh, strep bacteremia, uh, DVTs, and a prior history of ovarian cyst. Uh, so on her initial presentation and workup, she was a febrile. She was non-tachycardic with a heart rate of 84, and her blood pressures were low at 87 over 59, and she was saturating 97%. Her exam showed mild um, volume overload. With uh, She had no distress, but the JVD was up to 12 centimeters with a positive hepatojugular reflux and um, lower extremity edema. Her EKG... She had a uh, normal sinus rhythm, relatively narrow QRS with mild PVCs. The echo that she had done recently uh, showed confirmed the EF of 15 to 20%. LVD was 6.5, mildly dilated RV um, with moderately reduced RV, dis uh, RV function and small pericardial effusion. So once we she came to our center, we did a right heart catheterization. Uh, this was after she was placed on melanone and diuresed for a couple of doses. Her R RA pressure was three, PA pressure 48, 12, uh, mean of 28 with a wedge of 12. PA sat on the melanone was 66, giving her a FIC output and index of four and 2.4, TPG of 16 and a PVR of four. She had additional imaging uh, with the CT chest showing the, the pneumonia left lower lobe consolidation and edema. And just going back to give you a little bit of information about who she is, she had a cardiac MRI um, three years ago, confirmed the low EF, no LGE, no non-compaction. Um, she had some sort of, so a little bit of non-compacted myocardium in the lateral wall, um, not diffusely. She had a CPET evaluation two years ago um, when she was more compensated with the peak VO2 of 18 and the VEVCO2 in the year was low at 28. Initial lab, the only thing I'll highlight here is that her renal function was preserved, but her AST, ALT had a injury pattern of AST of 500 and ALT of 900 with an INR elevation to three. So with this was the initial presentation, um, and overnight, she, uh, after the initial catheterization, she didn't do well. She had worsening ventricular ectopy, runs of NSVT with worsening pulmonary edema. Uh, she had a swan in place in our uh, ICU, so we were able to monitor her hemodynamics. Initially showed that the RA pressure, which was initially 3, now is 12, and the PA sat, which is about 61, now is 49, and her cardiac index is 1.9. Um, uh, over the course of the night, tried to increase the Miller known with minimal improvement, with actually no improvement. So the decision was made that she needed additional support. Uh, she was considered for a placement of an Impella 5.5. However, she had small caliber vessels, which precluded the placement of this device. So she had a placement of a femoral balloon pump uh, that day and with subsequent uh, stabilization of her hemodynamics. So... Uh, after she was stabilized, we started our evaluation for advanced therapies. Initially, she was considered for both LVAD and transplant. However, the patient um, 
uh, with multiple team members refused LVAT, refused LVAT evaluation, was only considering transplant. So that was not uh, completed. So she was presented after doing the workup, she was presented to our committee and she was uh, approved for a heart transplant pending financial clearance and workup on the CT that showed some pulmonary nodules, which later were due to her edema. So with plans to, given her blood type, uh, which was an O, uh, we made plans to switch her femoral balloon pump to an axillary balloon pump on Dean 6. However, um, on day 11 of her hospitalization, she had multiple restriction alarms on her balloon pump. Uh, she was taken to the OR immediately and she was found to have a ruptured balloon pump, which was replaced in the axillary position. Uh, however, despite this, she had worsening VT, uh, uh, VT storm with hypotension, multiple shocks. Uh, we tried am IV amiodarone, IV lidocaine, um, even tried to ATP her out with her device. Uh, however, due to the persistent VT, we decided to upgrade her support and she was cannulated to VO VA ECMO. This was complicated by significant blood loss and vasoplegia requiring pressors. Um, we stabilized her that day. The next day, we were able to get her filling pressures down. Um, she, uh, she was a little over diarrhea, so she had some chattering on her. Uh, ECMO needed some fluid back. That day, we were able to list her as a status two uh, with an intent to submit for a narrative for a status one. Uh, I just wanted to show uh, her uh, ECMO cannulation, just uh, so everybody knows how we initially cannulated her. So over here, you see the green, which is uh, that um, inflow to the pump, uh, sorry, not the green, the blue, the inflow to the pump going uh, from the venous side into the pump, which takes the blood into the oxygenator, oxygenates her blood, and then returns to the arterial side, the red, um, which will is the outflow cannula return to her um, aorta. So that's the cannulation that she was on, in addition to the balloon pump, which is placed axillary for venting of her LV. So uh, unfortunately, she didn't do well with this configuration either. Overnight, she developed worsening pulmonary edema. Uh, on further evaluation, it seemed that the balloon pump had migrated to the ascending aorta. The panel on the left shows the marker uh, initially where the balloon pump was. It seemed like it was a little high. Uh, however, further evaluation showed that the markers had migrated up uh, across her aortic arch and into the um, high aorta. So she was uh, in, in the interim, we were uh, gonna take her to the OR while she was waiting. We diureased her, added dobutamine. She was now on dual anatropes. However, she did not tolerate it. She had worsening VT, became pale and diaphoretic and was intubated. The decision was made uh, to further escalate her support. Um, initially, we took her to the OR and placed a central temporary LVAD ECMO, which I'll show the configuration in a little bit, which is an LV apical uh, cannulation uh, to the aorta. However, even with this, her lows were her flows were very limited, uh, 0.3 to 0.5, uh, like thought due to severe RV failure. So the decision was made to give her a in addition to the LV uh, cannulation, the RV uh, cannulation as well. So her centromag bivad was a cannulation of LV apex to aorta with the centromag and as well as an RA uh, to PA uh, with the centromag. So this is a little schematic uh, to just show people where she was. Um, the panel on the left, it's a Berlin heart. It's not exactly what we gave her, but the cannulation is similar if you see if you can see my pointer, um, on the left, you have a cannula from the RA going to a pump that's uh, putting blood into the PA. That's the RVAD support. And then the LVAD support, you have an L LV apex uh, cannula that goes to, uh, which would be a centromag for our patient and will put blood into the aorta. And then on the right side is a further schematic of um, into the actual heart where these cannulas would fit. So um, after she had this, uh, all, all this escalation, um, she had a lot of bleeding. The chest was left open. She required about eight units of red blood cells, had a little bit of renal injury, which recovered. A couple of days later, we were able to close the chest. Um, we weren't able to make any decisions about advanced therapy because she had previously you know, declined LVAD, LVAD and she was too sick for transplant at that time. So we stabilized her. 
and eventually after some oropharyngeal bleeding uh, that was controlled, we extubated her, uh, stabilized her, and had further conversation with the patient. Well, thank you very much. It's a rather complex case, uh, but um, uh, I'm sure that uh, we will have uh, some comments. I'm not sure how much of these uh, technologies are available in Argentina. And I think that that, that is, is an interesting aspect of, uh, of the exchange. So um, I'm going to introduce Eduardo Perna. Um, I introduced him uh, initially, but uh, he will be the first one uh, to comment on this case. Eduardo. Yes, hello, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. It's glad to be here. Um, without a doubt, this is a very interesting and challenging case, uh, in particular here in Argentina. Okay, although this patient profile represents less than 5% of patients with acute decompensated heart failure who are usually admitted to the hospital, in high complexity centers in Argentina, it represents a situation that has been increasingly faced and managed. So uh, I would like to emphasize some important issues related with this case in particular. Uh, first, uh, I would like to say that cardiogenic shot uh, has a spectrum of severity. You know, uh, we know that uh, we can quantify it by the uh, SCAI uh, shock classification. So the comprehensive shock, uh, cardiogenic shock patient evaluation incorporates shock severity, phenotypes, and risk modifiers to predict survival and individualize the use of mechanical uh, circulatory support. Uh, and recent consensus statements have defined a uh, cardiogenic shock more broadly. It's important to keep in mind that hypoperfusion is a, a more important uh, aspect of the cardiogenic shock, even more than hypotension, because sometimes the hypoperfusion presents uh, hypotension and some patient has a normotensive cardiogenic shock. Um, the third topic is cardiogenic shock is a very dynamic process and it's imperative to ensure appropriate tailoring of therapy is achieved. So we have to monitor the patient with cardiogenic shock to identify early this kind of uh, complication or some refractory aspect of the management of this situation. In Argentina, in particular, uh, the availability of ventricular assistance with device is limited. With broader access to balloon, to con uh, EIBB, and to a lesser extent, ECMO. For example, my center is located in the north of Argentina. Uh, we perform heart transplant uh, in a different province from Buenos Aires. It's obvious. And we only have balloon. This is why the evolution of this patient could probably be very different with a greater possibility of more rapid adverse evolution here in, in our country. Uh, so what can we do differently in our reality? Probably more aggressive early nootropic support, combining, com combining dobutamine and milrinone. Uh, we use uh, the intraortic balloon pump with a prolonged support until an eventual heart transplant. We have reached more than 45 or 60 days, some patients with uh, this kind of support. Uh, probably early mechanical ventilation, um, the organ urgent registration for heart transplant This, Fortunately, this patient is being managed with many options available in your country. Um, perhaps the possibility of heart transplant or maybe a long-term mechanical assist device such a total artificial heart or biventricular assist device could be considered in your center uh, uh, for the next option. Um, I have a couple of questions about this case in particular. Uh, why this patient was not previously evaluated for a transplant or was she rejected for some reason? And the other question is why was the femoral uh, access to uh, intraortic balloon pump was replaced after six days? There was any reason or to facilitate the, the, the management of the patient? 
So, uh, Afsana, why don't you wait until the uh, comments from Dr. Montaner, and then when we come back to the conclusions, then if you could take note of these questions, maybe uh, you can uh, you can address them. So, thank you, Dr. Perna. So, um, uh, Dr. Montaner, um, we would like to hear your comments about this case. And you're muted. Yes. There you go. Thank you very much. Uh, for invitation to participate in chapter of American College of Cardiology with Argentine Federation of Cardiology and Argentine Society of Cardiology. Uh, this uh, complex case with use of technology, uh, hemodynamic support, very advanced, uh, what I don't have in my country, in Tucumán. Uh, I have a few questions uh, about this uh, about this case. Uh, in shock, in cardiogenic shock for infarction, was either mortality than in not ischemic heart disease in your countries. Uh, we see more shock cardiogenic with infarction and less cardiogenic shock with non ischemic heart disease in our country. Another question is, you, do you have a sequence according to the clinic evolution of the patient to use the support hemodynamic? Do you prefer one specific amount, especially due a shock phenotypic, uh, uh, is a right heart failure, left heart failure? And the question about the coagulation, this patient have an atrial fibrillation, a paroxystic atrial fibrillation and have an eye in her of three. She has a hepatic failure for this read, for this eye in her, or uh, she take warfarin or anticoagulants. And, and she's uh, bleeding, and who uh, manage this complication uh, of bleeding? This is my questions. Um, thank you very much. Okay, well, uh, I think uh, I understand, so I think there are a lot of questions about this case, and Afsana, you, I'm sure you, you had a lot of exposure to these technologies, so perhaps uh, as we go back to the conclusion of the case, you can address these questions uh, and then tell us what happened to the patient. Yes, um, uh, thank you for those questions. So I'll clarify a little bit. Um, you know, I, I was involved in her care from the very beginning, so... Uh, why was she not transplant, uh, considered for transplant earlier? So she was, she was only 29. She wanted to have children and was in a lot of denial. Um, she went to many different heart failure specialists. And after hearing that she needed to transplant, uh, she kind of just stopped seeing them. And then someone told her that maybe you can get a mitral clip. So she kind of thought, okay, I'll just do a mitral clip. I don't want to transplant. So she was in denial for a very long time, eventually came in shock. And then we had to do this. And then at our institution, um, because she was not able to get an Impella 5.5, which is our usual LV venting uh, preferred strategy because of her small caliber vessels, we went for the balloon pump. Uh, at our institutions, when we um, anticipate a, a prolonged wait time, which we would for her, uh, status two with the blood type O, we tend to replace femoral support and place it axillary so that patients can do physical therapy and remain functional, um, uh, functionality. So that was the decision um, for why we replaced the femoral. It was working well um, when it was. And then... Um, uh, Dr. Montaner, I'll try to answer the questions. I don't know if I caught all of them, uh, but for her, um, yeah, she had proximal AFib. She was on L, uh, oral uh, anticoagulation, which was stopped when she was in the hospital. She was on heparin um, and obviously stopped for many reasons with her bleeding. Um, she Her bleeding was, um, we thought, coagulopathy from um, a mix of coagulopathy of uh, critical illness, as well as from the mechanical support that she was having, um, the balloon pump and the ECMO. She had issues with her platelets. And post-surgically, um, she even had some bleeding, which I didn't include, from the LV apical cannula site and some of the sites that we had to go back and cauterize. So we thought the bleeding was multifactorial, surgical, mechanical support, and her critical illness. Um, and we just supported her through it with a lot of blood products. And then um, 
um, you know, got her through it. Um, I think, you know, like you guys um, un understood that this is a, a very sick, heroic effort. And even at our institution, we don't do this for every patient. Um, but, you know, she was very young and otherwise had good end organ function before all of this. We thought this was all shock mediated end organ dysfunction. So um, our team really didn't, um, you know, hesitate at any step when she needed further support. Um, our surgeons were on board and, you know, as you can see, they gave her uh, every support that she could need. And it was an amazing rescue for us. And um, just to kind of round it out, um, all day 33, uh, her slowly, uh, after we stabilized her, her RV failure seemed to improve with our hemodynamics. Um, and we really uh, talked to her, her family. Her mother was in Cuba. We got our, our letter to the embassy to get her mother to come see her, talk to her, um, and really convinced her, like, you, you're too sick for a transplant right now. You have meant, you're very sick. You got a lot of transfusions. For now, you should get an LVAD and, you know, recover, and then we can list you. So on day 33, she underwent heart mate uh, through placement with an intra-op epicardial VT ablation and uh, with an RVAD removal, which she was able to do. Um, she she did well afterward, just uh, one episode of ectopy and pneumonia on the floor. And um, she was she was walking around the unit, many laps, doing really well, and discharged home on hospital day fifty five. And then um, uh, outpatient, I was able to see her um, just like two weeks afterwards, uh, and even now a couple of weeks ago, she's doing really really well, vigorous, um, leaving leading a relatively full life. Um, she remains listed, but still inactive for transplant with hopes in the future. Thank you, Osana. I think one one thing that would also help um, the uh, the understanding of the different uh, status is uh, if you can tell us what status one uh, means here and status two and three, uh, and also uh, you talk about the narrative of to move her from status two to status one. So I think that uh, clarification of that would be helpful. Yes. So um, for our institution um, and uh, the UNOS classification, status one is the highest status listing you can have. And it's usually with patients who have ECMO support uh, or biventricular support. Um, and status two uh, patients are within hospital with some sort of mechanical support. It could be impella, it can be a um, balloon pump. Um, and status three just generally some inpatient with some sort of inotropic support. And then the other four, five, six, they're, they can be patients who are at home, either with a durable VAD or listed, but not too sick. So initially, uh, when she was, uh, she refused VAD and she was listed as a status two with a balloon pump. And we were planning on submitting, you can submit exceptions. We were planning on submitting an exception uh, uh, saying that she deserves a status one because one, we weren't able to put, um, we can't escalate her inotropes because she has a lot of VT. And, you know, she has small caliber vessels, so we couldn't really escalate her support from that side. So that was our plan to keep her on the balloon pump on a status two and try to get her a status one. You know, we don't know if it would have worked, but after after she destabilized on the balloon pump and she went to ECMO, we could have um, listed her as a status one. But, you know, with all the blood transfusions, the coagulopathy, um, all the issues that she had, she was not a candidate for transplant. So we actually never ended up listing her as a one, um, even though we could have at the time because uh, uh, we thought she would do better with the VAT. And I think, um, you know, looking back now, I think that was the right decision for her. She's only 29. Uh, she'll get good years out with the VAD, and then eventually, you know, she can get a transplant and she'll have many good years with that, hopefully. Yeah, and if you tell yes. us so the, that um, permission, so to speak, to list a status one goes to whom? To what organization? How centralized that is? So uh, we use the the United Organ of Network uh, uh, Procurement, so the UNOS uh, organization, and it is the organ procurement organization for all organs um, in America. So we submit, uh, uh, there's a whole network, and we submit the patient's information as well as their listing status to them, and there's a board which will review it, and then if you, which, and approve the status, and if you want an exception, like even if they each, uh, each status has a criteria in addition to what I mentioned. They need a specific cardiac index. 
a specific wedge, specific blood pressure. There are criteria in each um, bucket that you need to meet. And if you think a patient deserves a higher status, even though they don't meet it, you can list them with an exception. And that's a narrative you submit, and then the board will approve them and give them a higher uh, status. Thank you. Thank you. That was uh, very clarifying. I think we just have about four minutes. So Dr. Perna uh, or Dr. Montaner, do you have any other questions or comments about this case? Uh, yes, it's, it's the same uh, or similar in Argentina. We have four status for heart transplant, emergency A, B, uh, urgent transplant and elective. So uh, the, there are specific criteria for each status uh, uh, is, is clear that the, 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 not only the decision is based on the clinical profile, sometimes you have to take in consideration the, the decision of the patient. So the, the specific uh, thought about the, 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 the transplant or L, LBID, but the, this was a, a, a great result for a very difficult case. Congratulations. Thank you. Dr. Montaner, do, do you have a fi final words? If not, we will move on. You're muted. Thank you very much. Congratulations, Dr. Okay, well, thank you thank again, you. Asana. This uh, was a great uh, complexity. I think it was a great display of all the efforts that uh, some places uh, put into trying to improve the health of a patient, even in the most dire situation and in a very uh, difficult uh, socioeconomic environment. Uh, and you did a great job, not only taking care of the patient, but in presenting this case. So thank you so much, Asana. Thank you. So, um, uh, so before we present the, the case from Argentina, uh, I want to uh, reintroduce Dr. Jose Luis Navarro Estrada, who, as I said before, is a past president of the Argentinian Society of Cardiology, has been uh, very involved in the relationship between the two chapters, and is currently the governor of the Argentina chapter of the American College of Cardiology. And he will then uh, uh, address the other goal uh, uh, beyond the, the scientific exchange, which is the uh, observership uh, from Argentinian trainees in junior hospitals. Jose? Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, Jose Navarro Estrada. I'm very proud to be here this day of the first joint webinar of the ACC New York and Argentine chapter. Is it really uh, uh, proud for me to stay here today. Uh, as Julio told before, as Julio said before, uh, this uh, partnership pro uh, project began probably in 2018 and was organized in 2019. But uh, uh, thereafter, there was a interruption or as you know, the, for the pandemic. But after the pandemic, we started to work in very hard and very nicely uh, between the two chapters, the, between the, the, the American side, which is a New York chapter in the, in the, and the Argentine side, composed of the Argentine Federation and the Argentine Society of Cardiology. So we have been working hard these last two years and we uh, accomplished two new achievements, two new and great achievements. One, one of them is this, this uh, joint meeting, joint webinar. And the other, as Julio said, is, is the, the organizing of, of, of observership of Argentine residents visiting and training in New York hospitals. This was, uh, the, the residents were carefully elected with antecedents and uh, interview. And uh, we are now finishing the third rotation. Uh, let me now uh, to introduce you the first two pioneers who went last year to New York and uh, 
these are the doctors, Dr. Mercedes Quiroga from Buenos Aires and Dr. Sofia Revilio from Cordoba. And they are going to tell us a little bit about their experience in, in, this, uh, in those rotations. Mercedes. Um, I was able to go to rotate in New York to Montefiore Hospital. Uh, I was one of the first ones selected to go. Uh, it's funny, I first applied when they started in 2018, and uh, the fellowship was uh, interrupted due to the pandemic. Uh, but gladly for me, I applied once again when they reopened it and uh, I was glad to be chosen for it. Um, well, I think as we can also see in the case that Dr. Efsana presented, we have very different ways of doing things in Argentina, especially because we have very different technologies that you guys have. Um, but for us, given this opportunity being actually in a following training and uh, having the chance to see what you can do and the technologies that you have in the US is very enriching for us. Um, I think also um, for me, especially being from Buenos Aires, um, going abroad and seeing different healthcare system was very enriching as well. Um, not only because we got to see different ways of working over there, but we also got in touch with a lot of uh, fellow in, cardi in cardiology over there. And you have even very different ways of studying uh, oh, not only on your career on med school but also in the residency is very different how um, over there they distribute their time and how they apply things over there so for me it was very good to see other ways of working as well and also being had a, so I was sent to New York uh, New York is a very multicultural place as you guys know uh, so I got to be in touch also with a lot of people from abroad, not only people that were training over there in cardiology, but also from people from Spain and different other countries. So we got to have a lot of networking as well and sharing a lot of different ways of not only treating the patients, different ways of learning as well in everybody's residency. And um, of course, using even uh, different uh, kind of uh, drugs as well. For instance, I would like to add a little bit of the, the case that you present that we it was a little bit shocking for me, for instance, that one of our drugs that we have for heart failure, it's uh, Levosimendan. And for instance, in the US, you didn't have it. So uh, it was like a very uh, broad for me to go over there in a lot of ways. Um, get to know a lot of people. And well, I'm really thankful for having had that opportunity. So thank you for Dr. Navarro and thank you for Dr. Juli Panza for being the two heads of this uh, fellowship and then this partnership that we have started. Thank you, Mercedes. Uh, we have to be, we have to three minutes more for Dr. Sofia Reviglio. She's from Cordoba and she went to uh, New York uh, from the Argent, uh, Argentine Federation of Cardiology. Sofia, are you here? Wait, okay. I don't Good see afternoon. Sophia. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Well, uh, I participated uh, for the scholarship during my last year of residency. Um, the experience uh, was one of a kind. Before this trip, I had never traveled on my own, uh, and even less to such a big city. Uh, I went to the observership to the Lenox Hill Hospital. I rotated through all different areas uh, in the cardiology service, uh, through the CCU, heart failure, the cath lab, cardiac images. Um, I went there for two months and the experience was uh, great. Uh, I get to, um, to make a lot of friends uh, with the cardiology fellows, with the residents. The attendings were really kind. They explained me everything. They included me in their way of working. Uh, so it was very uh, a very beautiful experience to get to know uh, different ways of working, uh, to see uh, 
all the resources uh, that a country such as the U.S. has. Um, also, uh, I, 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 I was glad to see that here in Argentina, with the resources that we have and the technology that we have, uh, we do an excellent work as well. Uh, and that we have adopted a really a good ways of working as well, um, especially uh, at, the, at the way we treat patients. Uh, I also was uh, amazed by the amount of investigation and the amount of uh, uh, lessons that the, fe the cardiology fellows have. Um, that was also something that amazed me a lot. Um, also, I was very fortunate to find a place uh, to stay where I shared with other medical students and residents from other hospitals. So I, I also made a lot of friends there. Um, New York City was a whole experience. I felt uh, like traveling around the world in one city. There are people all around the world living there, different food, religions, and cultures. Um, I got to talk to a lot of people and enjoyed it a lot. I really appreciate this opportunity. I'm glad I took the chance and, and participated uh, for it. Uh, for me, it was a dream come true, and I hope that you continue uh, pursuing this uh, this uh, activity, these um, rotations, uh, because it was great, and I and I hope that more cardiologists can can travel to New York. I'm okay. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks, thanks for both of you for both of you. Uh, needless to say that we are very satisfied with this program, and we are planning to continue every year. And we are now organizing uh, for the next year. We have a new, new two fellows for this year, and and we are organizing this in in continuous form. So uh, let's proceed, and let me introduce uh, Dr. Florencia Cantora, MD, who is uh, resident, a four-year resident of the. Uh, residents of the cardiology of the Italian Hospital of Buenos Aires, and she's going to be the case two presenter. Hello. Florencia, are you here? Hi, hello to everyone. Thank you very much, Jose, for the presentation. And thank you very much to, for, to all of you for this opportunity. It's really a pleasure for me to be here with you sharing this meeting. So today we are going to talk about chronic ischemic heart disease and the case we are presenting today um, is about a 65 years old white male. As past medical history, he has obesity, dyslipidemia, hypertension and diabetes and no previous cardiovascular events. Um, he reports experiencing a burning sensation in the center of the chest for the past eight months, triggered by walking three blocks and relieved by rest. No changes in frequency or intensity were observed without any other associated symptoms. Because of that, he went to the primary care physician and he ordered for an exercise treadmill test and a transthoracic echocardiogram. After that, he prescribed aspirin, statins, and beta blockers. This is the EKG of the patient, which seems to be a normal EKG without any ischemic changes. The transthoracic echocardiogram showed a preserved LV systolic function with no regional abnormalities. And here we have the exercise treadmill test, which if you see, you can you can see an ST segment depression during exertion, especially in leads before to B6, accompanied by precordial discomfort at the workload of four meds. Additionally, we can see um, frequent BPCs. So here we have a patient uh, or a patient condition interpreted as stable chronic angina with a high risk exercise stress test because of chest pain at a low workload associated with ST segment depression. After that, he remained almost asymptomatic on medical treatment for one month. Nevertheless, the cardiologist requested a coronary angiography. 
So this is the coronary angiography. Here we can see the chronic total occlusion of LAG. And also we can see a significant stenosis of posterolateral branch of left circumflex artery. In this slide, we can see the right coronary artery without obstructions and right to left collaterals to LAD. Okay, so the patient we have now is a patient with stable chronic angina and a chronic total occlusion of LAD and a significant stenosis of posterolateral branch of circumflex artery. The question is, which is the best treatment option? First of all, we have guideline medical treatment alone that could be an option. Another option could be guideline medical treatment and PCI. And another option could be guideline medical treatment and CAVIT. So now we are going to discuss those questions. Thank you, uh, Florencia. So uh, uh, a very uh, common presentation, I think that we see a patient like this uh, almost on a weekly, if not a daily basis. So it would be very interesting to hear from our New York faculty about how they would approach a patient like that. So Dr. Feldman. All right, well, thank you so much for the opportunity. And first of all, it's a, it's a pleasure and privilege to uh, join this webinar with our Argentinian colleagues. I think the case is is truly excellent. There's a, a lot to unpack here. First of all, you know, this is a common presentation, stable angina presentation with uh, evidence of ischemia on a on a stress test. Number two, it's a diabetic patient, um, which certainly should be taken into account. Um, and I think a lot um, can be and should be taken into consideration, both in terms of data review, as well as clinical and geographic factor review when, when taking care of a patient like this. Um, I think, first of all, we do have a lot of data to um, make our decision-making. Um, data like uh, trials of diabetic patients, of, of uh, medical therapy uh, versus revascularization therapy, cabbage, freedom trial in diabetic patients. So we know there's certainly some benefit of uh, uh, bypass in patients with severe, at least multivessel coronary disease. Second of all, we do have very recent, uh, but quite good data about comparison of PCI versus medical therapy. The Orbita 2 trial was just presented and we can we can discuss whether this patient is uh, completely off uh, any anti-anginal therapies, although he's on at least metoprolol, at least one anti-anginal agent is on board um, versus uh, you know the benefits of medical therapy versus PCI in someone who is optimally treated. Um, and it sounds like in this case, at least on one anti-anginal therapy, the symptoms are somewhat minimal, although still present. Um, number three, I would say, is it's important to also understand what anatomy we're dealing with. And here you have a chronically occluded uh, mid-LAD artery, which is probably, if one had to guess, a culprit in the symptomatology, plus a second stenosis in the, in the OM2 or in the, in the lateral uh, portion of the uh, circumflex artery. Um, and anatomically, I think if you were to consider PCI, I think it is a favorable uh, CTO anatomy. If, if I saw it correctly, there may be even a little bit of a channel in the middle LED. It's not too long of a vessel. It's getting very good collaterals, which allows you visualization. So I think if you were to intervene, um, I think it, it is an LED that has a favorable anatomical configuration, and I think the result would be quite good. Um, so um, to summarize, uh, I think an approach to this patient, there is no simple uh, correct solution. I think you need to take into account, number one, what the data we have with regards to revascularization for such patient. Number two, how symptomatic is this patient? Is he doing 
a lot of physical activity? Is he trying to do more or is he limiting himself in terms of doing? Does he want or she do more? Um, because that will guide also your decision making. Um, certainly, this is a decision that patient uh, understanding and patient opinion should play a very large role. Um, but the option should be given to the patient. And I think if angina is still present, um, I would consider, you know, up titrating anti-anginal medications, number one. Number two, offering a PCI, um, a PCI of the LADCTO as the next step after up titrating anti-anginal medications. Thank you. Thank you, Dimitri. Ima, what would you do with a patient like this? So, no, thank you so much. Um, you know, I'm a, a heart failure doctor, actually. So we're always thinking about medications. This patient doesn't have heart failure. But my question, you know, back to, um, you know, the presenter, you did an excellent job, is in terms of medical therapy, what medical therapy were you able to give this patient? And what other therapies do you have in Argentina that you could offer this patient to medically manage them? Shall I ask, uh, answer the yeah. question? Yeah. yeah. Okay, we have aspirin, statins, beta blockers. Also we have nitrates that we use them very much on medical treatment. Um, and I think that's that's all for for symptomatic symptomatic patients. Ima, being a, a heart failure cardiologist doesn't exempt you from uh, treating these patients. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't really have too much more to add from mm -hmm. what Dimitri, you know, like excellently kind of described in terms of really assessing the patient and trying to match the therapy with the patient um, and, and taking it from there. So I would, I would probably continue to medically optimize this patient and then proceed with PCI if they continue to remain um, symptomatic. You, you wouldn't take him to the cath lab for this one. <clears throat> and then, um, you know, here our heart failure cardiologists have fangs out when they see a patient with LV dysfunction. But uh, I, I guess this is not a patient for you. Harry, I know that you have a lot of experience with this kind of patients. What would you do? Yeah, I think uh, Dimitri summed up very, very well that this patient has a lot of options and we don't have a hard and fast rule on which way this patient should go. Certainly there's no three vessel disease so uh, and, and LV dysfunction. So you don't necessarily have to move to bypass, which of course would help with progression of disease. The other thing is that uh, I think you really have to talk to the patient about what they want to do. How limited are they? Medications are great, but they also limit you in some ways too, the side effects of medications. And it comes into play, when you talk about diabetic patients, you wanna look at how the vessels look. That right is beautiful, it's very normal. And the circ is actually pretty normal other than the one lesion. And then after the before and after the CTO is quite normal. So oftentimes fixing this kind of a lesion is the one that is, is the type of diabetic patient that might have good response to PCI long-term once they're on maximal medical therapy for progression of disease, aspirin, DAP for short term and high intensity statin PCSK9 therapy. So I would say that you talk to the patient, but um, I would give a high weight uh, to doing a PCI of the LAD and then also of the CERT. You essentially get the syntax score all the way down in that kind of a patient and letting medications prevent recurrence and progression of disease because it looks like the kinds of arteries that are less likely to progress because they look fairly smooth. Uh, that being said, that's kind of how we would probably do it here, but I think you could make the option of continuing medical therapy and then waiting for the patient to progress. But the patient had symptoms at a relatively low workload, relatively young individual. I think oftentimes if you get, get the PCI done in this kind of patient, you can obviate the need for the medications that have their own problems with quality of life and, and, uh, and focus on the medications that have no symptoms, but instead uh, delay, delay or prevent progression. And do you use any other medication? I think after the PCI, it would be aspirin, short-term DAPT, um, and uh, PCSK9, and uh, high-intensity statin to get the LDL as low as possible and certainly less than 70. I think we have good evidence that the rate of progression uh, seems uh, minimized in those patients. 
I think if this patient had a lot of diffuse disease, I might think otherwise uh, and maybe trial more medications up front and then let the patient present with more symptoms before proceeding with PCI. Um, but that's my that, that's my thoughts at, at present. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Harry. So I, you know, in our center, we we see a lot of these patients, and uh, we, as a matter of fact, even this morning we had a discussion. I want to hear from Dr. Feldman and then from Dr. Vidula about what is the impact that this chemia trial has had. And let's say that this patient. Um, became asymptomatic with medical treatment, has ischemia and stress test, but has normal, which I'm, I'm not sure that we have emphasized enough, has normal left ventricular function, no regional motion abnormalities. Uh, so would you consider not even doing a cath in a patient like this? Yeah, no, Dr. Dr. Panza, this is a, a terrific and excellent question. I think in, um, you know, multiple centers, centers um, in U.S. and O.U.S., there are different approaches to a patient like this. I think non-invasive imaging, um, nuclear stress testing or CTA and geography to um, delineate coronary anatomy prior to or making decision whether the patient needs to go to the cath lab is, is a common strategy to rule out uh, left main disease, to rule out uh, proximal osteo LED disease, and then making decision of whether um, patient needs a diagnostic angiography or not. Um, and here, once the angiography is done, I think your point is well taken. Uh, given the ischemia trial, we have to consider um, how symptomatic is the patient. And I think how much ischemia you have should also take into account as we do have some data that, you know, the more ischemia that's present, um, especially in patients with, with LAD or proximal uh, vessels, um, that the outcomes with revascularization in general, based on some uh, perhaps not, not completely randomized, but some, some non-randomized data um, uh, tend to be better. So I think all those factors, including the overall findings of the ischemia trial, but where the disease is, how much ischemia is present, how symptomatic the patient in, go into the equation and into the decision-making. Hima, do you have any further comments? No, nothing more to add. You know, I think, as, as we said, I think we just have to continue to follow the patient closely and with each therapy that we choose, see how how they're feeling and match it up to their, um, not only clinical outcomes, but also quality of life. Okay, Florencia, tell us what, what happened to the patient. Okay, so as most of you said, we, we have decided to do a percutaneous intervention of the CTO of LID. And now we are going to see in some videos. Okay, here we have, videos of the revascularization of the CTO of LAD, and we can see the complete revascularization of the artery. Both videos are very similar. And in both, we can see the, the complete revascularization. Okay, so here we can see before the PCI, um, the chronic total occlusion of LAD and the significant stenosis of posterolateral branch of circumflex artery. And then in the other image, we can see the complete revascularization of the CTO of LAD after PCI. So after the successful procedure, the patient remained asymptomatic and with good functional capacity. So that's all. Special thanks to Dr. Jose Luis Navarro Estrada, who helped me with the presentation, and Aníbal Arias and Fernando Cohen, who helped me with the resolution of the clinical case. And thank you very much to all of you. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Florencia. And uh, thank you, everyone. This may go on record as one of the first webinars that finishes on time. Uh, and actually, we uh, we were going to finish even earlier than uh, than we originally uh, intended. I think that um, 
uh, you know, this is the first time that we that we're doing this. Um, uh, we have recorded this, so I think other people will have the opportunity to see it. I think uh, it is a, a great demonstration of uh, the things that can come out of this uh, relationship uh, in terms of exchanging ideas, things that how we think about approaching a very common patient like the second one, and also see how we can approach a very complex patient uh, here with all the technologies that, that we have available as it was the case uh, of, uh, of the first patient. I want to thank everyone. Um, I want to thank uh, the presenters who did a great job. And I think it's great to, uh, to see the trainees involved in this uh, very much so. We heard uh, from uh, Dr. Kiroga and Dr. Rivigla about the, the experiences that, uh, that they had and how helpful and meaningful uh, it was for them. Uh, and not only for the time that they spent here, but likely for the, for the rest of their careers. So um, I also want to uh, thank uh, all the faculty and, uh, and in particular, uh, the governors. Uh, all we have here with us, the, the three governors, the immediate past governor, the current governor and the incoming governor, uh, because uh, they, uh, they were uh, essential in really providing the underpinning, the financial underpinning to this uh, um, relationship, this collaboration. Uh, and I hope uh, uh, to Dr. Feldman as the incoming governor that he sees the fruit of the labor of uh, his predecessors and is, uh, and is willing to continue with this and you see what, what can come out of this. So um, thank you again. Uh, I think that I have the sense that this will be the first of, uh, of a number of continued webinars. Um, I think the one good thing of the pandemic is that it got us used to uh, being um, you know more present virtually and then allowing this type of things uh, literally across the world. So we are all used to taking advantage of this um, of this technology that, that we have. Yeah, so I'd thank like you also very much. Uh, 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 Harry, you're 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 the governor. So uh, yeah I want to thank you, Dr. Panza. Yeah. I think you've been instrumental in this for five years now. And I think in my humble opinion, this is uh, the best twin relationship we have in the National ACC. I think it, it is an example, testament to your efforts and everybody's efforts to get these individuals here in a reciprocal way to see what America is about. But maybe in the future, we have some people go down there as well to see uh, what's going on in Argentina as well. I think it opens all of our eyes to uh, how different things can be done in different places. So again, thank you, Dr. Panza, for organizing this uh, as well and for everybody for participating. Well, and we have among us the the, the chair elect of the board of governors, that uh, and a trustee of the American College of Cardiology. So, Hima, I, I, I'm sure you will be a, a voice of continuity of this effort that we have had. I think she, may, she may have had to leave. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. Uh, um, I'll give you back, I think, what, uh, 10 minutes to spare in your life. And uh, I hope to see you around soon.